The uh, last part of this uh, theory chunk, uh, section is to combine um, a model that, that integrates uh, or combine an ERP model and an oscillatory process model into one. So the task now is to learn um, from both event-related potential features in the time domain and so on, and some oscillatory features at the same time, which of those features are relevant in a sense, what the re necessary spatial filters are, and things like that. So basically all in one. And also learn how, m how many sources are relevant and so on. So we're really throwing it all into one bucket. And uh, the appeal of that is, of course, we leave it all to this optimization procedure to find the right parameter setting. And we don't have to put in any information on what we think is relevant. Uh, it can be done as easily as saying, my data is a single trial is instead of the ERP matrix or instead of a covariance matrix for some um, frequency band, it is the block diagonal concatenation of an ERP matrix and whatever covariance matrix is. For example, covariance matrix for one frequency band in the whole time range, covariance matrix of the data under another of the trial, under another frequency band, another frequency band such as 10 hertz, you know, 10 to 15, 15 to 30 hertz, or so on. So that's the kind of trial that you stick into the same optimization problem that we had before. You just concatenate all this. And then you will learn weight matrices that have kind of the same shape. They will be 0 everywhere except where there is some e potentially some ERP process happening in, in this matrix. Uh, and, and they might learn some of these spatial filters and so on. Uh, for oscillatory processes. And when you, the reason why we're block building it that way is if you're calculating the rank of a block uh, or the sum of singular values of a block diagonal matrix, it's the same as calculating the rank of this plus the rank of this plus the rank of this plus the rank of that. So it's basically the sum of the ranks of all blocks. And so for this reason, um, it'll learn a small subset of spatial filters out of your oscillatory block or out of your ERP block. Uh, and it'll drive many of these components uh, effectively to 0. So you, that's why you're learning a sparse subset. There's, there's one thing to be said. When you're blowing up the number of parameters like that, you know, you're, you're throwing tons of numbers in there and maybe multiple frequency bands and things. And you might wonder whether at some point the whole thing breaks down under its own weight, in a sense or fails, you know, overfits terribly. It turns out that um, when you're having regularizers of, of this kind of general form that act like an L1 penalty on something, some function of your weights, um, so you, you have a sum of terms in the terms of a certain type, you know, non-negative, there's some singularity at zero, and so on. If you are having a term like that, um, and we're, say we're, we're calling these things features, uh, there is a bunch of st statistical guarantees that have been derived for the first time in 98 by Andrew Eng, um, which says, says that um, finding which ones of all these possible features are relevant, are non-zero, and which ones are zero, can be done with very, very high statistical efficiency. You can, do, you can basically find out which is the right non-zero pattern for some data um, uh, for a number of irrelevant features, that's basically exponential in the number of observations that you had. So if you have 100 trials, you can learn which one is the, you know, the right features out of a million features or something like that. So uh, that's, that's the type of result where you wonder whether they got their math right, you know, exponential, what the hell? Um, and so that is, um, in a sense, if it's a possibility to overcome the so-called curse of dimensionality, you can have tons of features, um, millions in fact, as long as you can frame it such that you only need a few of them, that somehow it's sparse in some sense. And it doesn't necessarily mean that a feature is set to zero and, and, um, or things like that. It can be things like the rank of a matrix is in a sense you know, low or various combinations of these. So it can be rather subtle functions of your weight matrix. And so that's a very, very flexible framework. And it's still rather easy to implement all this and to customize, you know, put in sums of terms that correspond to certain kinds of assumptions that you're making and so on. So 
there is, you know, there's even further generalizations. I sh shouldn't even go into that. Um, but, you know, just to give you an idea, you could say, you know, simple example, you have multiple subjects and you're learning a weight matrix. And for one subject, you learn one vector. And for another subject, you learn another vector, weight vector, and so on. You do this in a whole matrix, say 10 subjects. If you're solving all this as one optimization problem, which sort of covers all these subjects, you can effectively encourage that this whole matrix that you learn is low rank. And so there's a small number of latent factors, um, in the sense of weight profiles, that replicate across subjects. And each subject has a different loading on these small number of factors. And so you encourage some kind of uh, um, sharing of statistical strength, as it's being called, across unrelated, seemingly unrelated tasks, or not necessarily completely related tasks. And that's an example of what's called multitask learning. And so it's not just about uh, these rather simplistic um, things that we've been discussing before. The framework you know, scales to very, very uh, flexible things. And that, of course, also applies in whole other disciplines. So uh, it just to show you some of these final prediction functions, I if you're calculating the probability that your um, label is 1 instead of minus 1, you can say, say, why is this result? It's, you know, um, the logistic term here, and here's the spelled out linear map, you know. Um, for an oscillatory process, it's x times x transpose, which is sort of, you know, proportional to the covariance matrix inner product with this theta. For the ERP case, it's just the x itself, just the data trial. And in the combination case, it's sort of a matrix that's the concatenation of these blocks. x, um, you know, the covariance matrix of x with some temporal filter, covariance matrix with another temporal filter, and so on, in some matrix writing. This is one way to write it. You could also write it differently. Um, but, you know, just so that you have an equation that, that one can actually use. And, and that is um, the end of this. Uh, well, that theoretical tour de force, <laughs> in a sense. And um, in, the, in the last part of this lecture, I'll just say a few practical words. So um, you cannot easily solve problems of this size with uh, this well-known uh, MATLAB solver named CVX, which is a very general purpose thing. You probably need something more custom. Maybe you write it yourself or so. There is one that is called dual uh, it's called DAO. Uh, it's a dual augmented Lagrangian framework type solver, which is uh, applicable to es essentially everything that I said. And it was originally, in fact, written to solve these kinds of problems. It is very fast, converges very quickly. There's source code on the internet. It's included in BCI Lab. So you can immediately apply this to all of that. There is a framework um, that's an alternative to that, which is even more flexible. Basically, you can it pretty much doesn't really impose any, any constraint on how many terms you have or what kinds of things you can do in these terms as long they are, as they are all convex. Uh, that's called ADMM, Alternating Direction Method of Multipliers. And that is not only very fast, but it also gives rise to very, very simple MATLAB code. There is a web page, if you Google for this, where they have something like 20 examples or so. And it's usually you know, a one-page MATLAB script that solves various kinds of problems of uh, you know, sort of similar ballparks of uh, of complexity. Uh, basically, you know, I'm not going to explain how this works. There's a paper on that. But ultimately, it boils down to solving optimization problems for each term separately. Uh, you know, uh, say, if you have two terms, solve one and then the other. In many cases, they are very simple, because in one case, you say just a logistic loss. In the other case, it's just some kind of a, um, L1 norm or so thing, soft thresholding. And then in the third step, you fix the discrepancy between your two solutions, in a sense. Um, you fix the residual. Uh, and there is some, uh, you know, some theoretical background of why that works. And then you just iterate this. So you alternatively optimize the various terms. And if you have multiple terms, it goes round robin and so on. So, but there is a whole paper on, on that as well. And there is a whole range of other well-known machine learning methods in this general convex framework. I mean, I'm not re no one is here really um, making up something fundamentally new. <laughs> so support vector machines uh, are entirely in this framework. They use a different loss function as opposed to logistic. They use the so-called hinge loss, which goes like this, as opposed to you know this. Um, oh, sorry. Anyway, so there is um, multiple kernel learning, which is 
instead of covariance matrices as we did here, uses kernel matrices um, and has might have group sparsity applied to the kernel weights and so on. There's hierarchical kernel learning, which is uh, really advanced. It learns small numbers of nonlinear um, features, basically. Linear regression is in that. Uh, in that case, it becomes even simpler. You can drop most terms, and it boils down to a quadratic optimization problem and so on. So uh, there's, there's a whole range of things that you can kind of understand from this viewpoint. And uh, that's not really the end of this uh, lecture. <laughs>